The English philosopher Francis Bacon said, men fear death as children fear the dark. And as that natural fear in children is increased with tales, so is the other. Many Americans fear that on the day that they die, the tax man will come knocking at their family's door. But as with children's natural fear of the dark, the fear of the death tax has been increased with tales. The estate tax is complicated, and it is intimidating. It needs serious reform. I support repeal, but we need certainty in this area. So we need a deal that can garner 60 votes. We need to provide predictability and, and relief for taxpayers like ranchers and farmers in Montana. But the fact of the matter is, 99 times out of 100, the tail is worse than the tax. Less than 1% of all states are currently subject to a state tax. According to IRS data, out of nearly 2.5 million deaths in 2004, about 19,300 estates paid the estate tax. These numbers have decreased as the exemption level has increased. The tax will completely disappear in 2010. But then, as in the children's campfire tale, it returns in the end in 2001. Many small business owners fear that their kids will have to liquidate the business to pay the state tax. Once again, the tale there is worth than, worse than the tax. The Congressional Research Service reports that very few family businesses are subject to the state tax. In addition, very little of the tax is collected from family businesses. In 2003, only a little more than three out of 100 businesses where, where the owner died had an estate tax liability. The reason is planning. States can eliminate the tax burden with a myriad of tax provisions. One way to decrease the amount of the gross estate is by electing a special use valuation. When certain conditions are met, an estate can revalue certain farm and closely held business real property at its special use value rather than at fair market value. The state can further decrease its taxable estate through deductions. The marital deduction, deduction for charitable giving, just to name a few. Families can also form family partnerships and use different trust instruments in estate planning. Through such planning, many taxpayers lower their estate tax and some even eliminate it. But does estate tax planning need to be so complex? For many smaller estates, the problem with the current estate tax is that law keeps changing every year. The state tax law will change every year from 2008 through 2011. It's easy to just say plan, but with the state of the current state tax laws, a family cannot have just one plan. Families must have multiple estate plans, and that's expensive. Today, we'll hear about the complexity in estate tax planning as a result of the changing law. We'll hear that some estate tax fears are like a childlike fear of the dark, and we'll see whether this committee, at least, can resist the temptation to increase those fears with campfire tales of our own, but rather try to find a solution, a durable solution, to this um, very vexing problem that's affecting so many people. And I'd like now to turn to Senator Grassley, ranking yeah. member of the committee. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and particularly for holding this hearing and for always being available to discuss and work for uh, reform of the estate tax, modernizing it, and voting with us on several occasions. Uh, we have made significant progress throughout the, the years, but all of our hard work will be undone in 2011 if Congress does not act before then. Uh, under current law, in that year 2011, a state tax will return to a rate of 55 percent and sometimes up to 60 percent of assets above a million dollars. Uh, the tax uh, must be paid within nine months of the death of that person. I believe that the estate tax uh, is unjust from a philosophical or even technical viewpoint. From a philosophical perspective, I've always said that death should not be a taxable event. There is something fundamentally wrong when the government swoops in after a funeral to take a cut of what that person had worked their whole life for and has already paid taxes at least once on the money. Any monetary benefit obtained by any individual is either taxed or not taxed for a very specific reason. As long as a person has accumulated an estate in accordance with the law, the government should not uh, be able to profit from uh, just because of the incident of death. From a technical standpoint, and maybe more importantly than even the philosophical one, 
is the death tax is flatedly flawed in that, owing to the due date of nine months after death, the estate tax forces survivors to liquidate assets in economically poor circumstances. Instead of the free market determining when assets are bought or sold, the death tax makes that determination. As most people are not privy to the exact date that they will hand over half of everything they owe to the government, the death tax then is fundamentally not fair. Whenever a discussion of death tax comes up, especially on the Senate floor, it is fashionable for some of my colleagues to talk about the very wealthy as if they should base uh, our, as if we should base our actions solely on how they impact billionaires. According to Forbes, as of March of this year, there were approximately 946 billionaires throughout the world, and of course, many of them not Americans. Even if all of them were Americans, I believe that a few of the other 300 million people we collectively represent would like us to keep them in mind as well as, as we consider this issue. I want to mention that some real people live in Iowa and who have graciously agreed to be with us to share their story. Not only do they live in Iowa, they have devoted their entire life for a multiple generations to build businesses and create good jobs uh, for the people of Iowa. And as I see at the table, uh, Eugene and Mary Sukup uh, started a grain handling and storage manufacturing company in uh, Sheffield, Iowa, a very small town. Today, the Sukups and their two sons and their families still headquarter there in a population 938. They employ 350 people in good paying jobs with good retirement plans. Mr. Sukup will tell his own story, but we should all keep in mind what he says as we contemplate what to do with the uh, death tax. 40% of a billion dollars is still a great deal of money, but how we deal with the estate tax will determine whether businesses like Sukup Manufacturing Company are able to survive and continue serving their community. I, I want to highlight a few numbers that the Joint Committee on Taxation has made available for this hearing. The Joint Committee estimates that in 2009, there will be 9,600 estates subject to the estate tax. Of course, that number falls to zero in 2010, but jumps up to almost 62,000 compared to the 9,600 in 2009 by 2011, then 62,000 estates, and will continue to increase very dramatically through the years. I know for a fact that most of these 62,000 will not be billionaires, I have consistently maintained that the death tax should be completely repealed, but have also let it be known that I'm willing to compromise. What I am not willing to compromise on is that we need to make sure that we're looking out for small business owners and family farmers in order to ensure that what amounts to a personal tragedy does not amount to a government-driven uh, fiscal tragedy as well. And I'm sure that somebody's going to denigrate the efforts that not very many family farmers are caught up in this. But that statement was made before the price of farmland uh, almost uh, doubled in the last four or five years uh, because of, mostly because of ethanol, I guess. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, viva ethanol. <laughs> okay, um, now I'd like to introduce my, our panel. First witness is uh, Mr. Warren Buffett, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Berkshire Hathaway. A second, uh, Conrad Titel, who is a principal that uh, specializes in state, uh, estate tax planning, state planning at Cummins Lockwood. Uh, we also have Dean Rhodes, a state senator from Nevada, here today, um, although he'll be testifying as a rancher, giving his experience with state tax. And last witness is, as mentioned by Senator Grassley, and Mr. Eugene Sukup, who is chairman of the board for Sukup Manufacturing. Thank you all for coming. The general rule here is um, um, your, wit your testimony, your written testimony will be included in the record. Uh, I'd encourage you each to speak about five minutes, then we'll open up to questions. And thank you all for making the time and effort to come here. Deeply appreciate it. Mr. Buffett. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senators, I appreciate the opportunity to express a few views on the estate tax. I'll limit my remarks to three points. The first relates to the intellectual dishonesty employed by those who use the phrase death tax. This term is clever, it is Orwellian, and it is, if you'll pardon the expression, dead wrong. 
More than 2.4 million Americans will die this year. About 12,000 of, of them will leave in a state that will be taxed when it goes down to, uh, when the exemption goes to 3 million, as Senator Grassley mentioned. Uh, it'll be 9,600 estimated, and it's been 19,000 when the exemption was higher. That means that 99.5% of estates will be tax free. You would have to attend 200 funerals to be at one at which the decedent's estate owed a tax. Indeed, far more people who die receive a large tax benefit. I don't think that's generally understood. Namely, a stepped-up basis on appreciated assets. If people insist on renaming the estate tax, it would be more appropriately labeled the death present. The second point I would like to make is that in a country that prides itself on equality of opportunity, it is becoming anything but that as the gap between the super rich and the middle class widens in dramatic fashion. Here are a few figures on the Forbes 400. Other people save their Playboy magazines. I saved the Forbes 400 magazine. Um, uh, 20 years ago, 1987, it took $220 million to make the list. Now it takes $1.3 billion, about a six for one increase. The total wealth of the list in 1987 was then $220 billion. Now it's $1.54 trillion, exactly a seven for one increase. Tax law changes have benefited this group, including me, in a huge way. During that same period, the average American went exactly nowhere on the economic front. His income went from a median 26,061 to 48,201, almost exactly the increase of the CPI during the 20 years. He's been on a treadmill while the super rich have been on a spaceship. Dynastic wealth, the enemy of a meritocracy, is on the rise. Equality of opportunity has been on the decline. A progressive and meaningful estate tax is needed to curb the movement of a democracy toward a plutocracy. Finally, I have a suggestion. Estate taxes now raise about $24 billion. It's one of the lowest percentages, incidentally, of total taxes uh, in the history of uh, the tax system. As mentioned, that $24 billion will come from about 12,000 estates. Indeed, half of that sum will come from only about 1,500 estates. The beneficiaries of each of those estates will receive millions, in many cases tens of millions or more. One point you never hear from proponents of estate tax elimination is whom they would get the $24 billion from if they didn't get it from the 12,000 largest estates. They just say, free us. They don't say who to sh further shackle. Here's the suggestion. Keep the estate tax in its $24 billion. Reshape it, if you will, but keep the estate tax in its $24 billion. Then take a look at the bottom fifth of America. There are 23 million households in the United States with 20,000 or less of income. Many are paying payroll taxes that now total 15.3%. That 15.3% alone is more than the rate on dividends or capital gains and more than the rate on carried interests. Let's give those 23 million households a $1,000 annual credit. Every dollar of such a credit would affect real change in the lives of the 50 million plus people residing in the 23 million households. Yet the cost of this would be less than getting rid of the tax on the 12,000 estates. 50 million people would be helped in a material way. The beneficiaries of the 12,000 estates would still receive what looks like a fortune to almost all Americans. Leona Helmsley's dog, Trouble, reportedly is inheriting $12 million. If Mrs. Helmsley's estate is in the 45% bracket, Trouble could instead receive $22 million if the estate tax was removed. Alternatively, just from Trouble's share of the Helmsley estate tax, 10,000 families making less than 20,000 annually could receive $1,000 each to make their lives a bit better. Even though Trouble probably heard Leona say, quote, only the little people pay taxes, end quote, I don't think he would mind the estate paying $10 million in order for him to get his $12 million. We need to raise about 20% of GDP to fund the programs the American people want from the national government. Further shifting of this requirement away from the super rich is not the way to go. Thank you, Mr. Buffett. Mr. Titel.
Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, members of the um, committee, I'm Conrad Titel. I am a, an estate planning lawyer with Cummings and Lockwood based in our Stanford, Connecticut office. We have over 50 of our lawyers who were involved in estate planning day in and uh, day out. I also teach this stuff at a law school and I write books and articles on this and thanks to you and the IRS and the Treasury I'm continually and constantly uh, updating and revising uh, my uh, books. In Gone with the Wind, Margaret Mitchell said, death, childbirth, taxes never come at a convenient time. She might have added that the certainty of those events never come at a known time. When this Congress gave birth in 2001 to the estate tax law. Um, it enacted a roller coaster uh, exemption. All but troglodytes uh, are aware that uh, we have a uh, $2 million exemption this year, next year, 2009. It goes up to $3.5 million. And then, in, <coughs> excuse me, in 2010, the estate tax is gone with the wind. Although, uh, Mr. Buffett, at that time, there is a carryover basis for that one year. <clears throat> it is said that the meek shall inherit the earth, and they shall do so with a stepped-up basis, but not for, the year, uh, not for the year 2010. And then in 2011 and later years, the estate tax blows back in with a $1 million exemption, and they 55% rate, and as Senator Grassley mentioned, in some cases as high as a 60% rate. Um, my charge today was not to talk about whether there should be a tax or whether there should not be a tax, but to talk about the complexities uh, in planning. My uh, written statement uh, goes into great detail. What I would like to do is just highlight a, a few of, of the points. and. Some of the people that you've been talking about, perhaps the millionaire next door, for married um, couples and um, families with an estate just between one and two million dollars, we find it very difficult to plan f for them. As Senator Baucus uh, pointed out, we have to make three or four uh, plans. And then when we get some minor millionaires, people who have a taxable estate of five million dollars. Let's just take a look at the arithmetic and see what happens over the next few years. Death in 2008, why the estate tax turns out to be 1.35 million dollars. In 2009, it's 675,000. 2010, it's zip, zero, but with a carryover rather than a stepped up basis. And then in 2011, that five million dollar taxable estate, ah, in that year, the tax is, would be $2 million. Uh, now, we live in a very complex society, and our tax laws reflect the complexity of our society. But the tax law that the Congress gave birth to in 2001 makes complicated plans even more complicated. Just to tick off a, f a few of the uh, areas that we have to deal with, life insurance planning. Life insurance is part of an estate uh, plan to provide liquidi liquidity and also to pay uh, taxes. That has become very difficult. Uh, Rodney Dangerfield once said that he gets no, uh, what, gets no what? Respect. Respect. Thank you very, very much. Well, the um, estate tax law, when clients come into our office and in my lectures throughout the country, they, the comment I hear is, how could the Congress do that? There is no respect for the estate tax law, and the disrespect for one law, I believe, breeds disrespect for other laws, such as the gift and the estate uh, tax. One of the problems we have is some people say, let's wait and see what happens. Well, that may work out all right in some cases, but in other cases, um, delay can be hazardous to your wealth. Now for a ray of sunshine, a bright note. Charitable contributions are not complicated at all. There's an unlimited 
a state tax charitable deduction, and that's been in the law for over 100, almost 100 uh, years. So whatever the Congress does, uh, there's a great precedent for continuing uh, that state tax unlimited charitable deduction. You know, Thanksgiving is almost upon us, and in our family, we at Thanksgiving every year have a tradition. We have a marathon monopoly game. It goes on all weekend, but this year, to make the game more realistic for my grandchildren, I've indexed the game for inflation. So, for example, if you were to land on Park uh, Place and you wanted to buy it, it now costs $5 million. You know that card, the chance pay tax collector, $200? Well, now, if you get that card at 7 or 8 o'clock, pay $20,000. If you get it at 9 o'clock, pay $10,000. If you get it at 10 o'clock, you don't have to pay anything at all. But if you get it at 11 o'clock, if you get it at 11 o'clock or thereafter, why then you have to pay $40,000. Now this surely will make our monopoly game much more interesting. But our nation's tax laws should not be a roll of the dice. Do you issue more money to your players? <laughs> Pardon me? Do you issue more money to your players, too? Um, like the government, we print it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well said, Mr. Rhodes. <laughs> Sixty miles northwest of Elko, Nevada. I've been involved in the livestock industry activities my whole career as a rancher. I have also been a state senator since 1984. My state senate district is the largest in the United States outside of Alaska and stretches over 73,000 square miles. My district is larger than 34 states and accounts for over two-thirds of the land area of Nevada. Prior to serving as a state senator, I serve three terms in the Nevada State Assembly. I am the past chairman of the Public Lands Council and affiliate of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and also the past chairman of their Public Lands Committee. Today I'm here on behalf of all the ranchers, farms, and small businesses in my district as well as those throughout the state of Nevada. Although I'm going to tell you the story of my family, there are many others like me who have been generally impacted by the estate tax. Since shortly after my wife Sharon and I graduated from college, we have lived on the ranch that was established by her parents in 1943. We now own the ranch. Our daughter, her husband, and our two teenage grandsons all work on the ranch. We also have a nine-month-old grandson. Our other daughter, her husband, and our granddaughter live on a ranch in southern Oregon. My father-in-law came to Elko County in the 1930s when he was 15 years old. He worked as a cowboy and a ranch hand, saved his money, and eventually bought his first property over 60 years ago. My father-in-law became a good friend of Bing Crosby when he owned ranches in Elko County, including one adjacent to my father-in-law's ranch that we purchased in 1966. My wife and family lived there for 18 years. I believe if we had a willing buyer, our ranch would be valued at about $2.5 million in today's market assuming it was not broken up or sold for water. My mother-in-law died in 1976. My father-in-law paid a total estate tax then of over $300,000. To do this, he could not afford to keep the ranch where my wife and I and our two daughters lived, the old Bing Crosby Ranch. Losing this ranch and our home was not only a personal blow, but it was crippling to our operation. This was our primary hay ranch, and at 6,000 feet in elevation, we need every bale of hay we can produce. Losing this ranch meant we were forced to buy hay almost every year since 1985. <clears throat> when my father-in-law died in 1995, there was no more land left to sell if we wanted to survive in the ranching business. Based on the ranch's value, the tax we now owed with, with interest added was over $340,000. Therefore, we've been paying $18,000 in estate taxes plus interest every year, which we are continuing to pay. We've had to borrow money to make these payments. 
We pay this money back through the revenues produced by our ranching businesses. Because of this, I can say without a doubt that we have not made very many capital improvements to our ranch, nor have we been able to take advantage of some expansion opportunities to plan for the future when our grandchildren might want to continue the tradition started by my wife's parents 66 years ago. I appreciate the Senate Finance Committee holding this hearing to investigate problems caused by the uncertainty of current law. But my family is a good example of what happens when the law does not offer solutions. Hopefully any future solutions will provide my family and other families like us some relief down the road. A current estimate of the value of our cattle would be about 1100 to 1300 per, per mature pregnant cow with a calf at her side. Understanding that the cattle market is not constant, we own about $2 million worth of production units in our ranching business, in addition to our yearly a horse herd and, and the land value. Let me illustrate the uncertainties of planning. Under current law, if my wife and I were killed in a common accident in December of 2009, our family ranch would be valued at about $7 million, counting all the land and all the animals. Because my wife and I have tried to do some estate planning to divide our ranch assets between us, my daughter should have a $3.5 million exception on my estate and a $3.5 million exemption on their mother's estate. They would not have to sell any land or cattle to pay the federal government, assuming the ranch does not continue to increase in value and also assuming that the ranch was not broken up for the water. But if they were faced with dealing with our estates in January of 2011, they would owe nearly $2.5 million within nine months of our death. <coughs> that would be in addition to over $640,000 we have paid in estate taxes to the federal government. So how do we plan without some certainty? Everyone in my family wants to continue our ranching business. Ranching is a tough way to make a living, but we can do it and make a profit over time. It is difficult, but we can deal with the variables of weather, drought, labor shortage, market conditions, and day-to-day -day businesses, expenses such as the increasing price of fuel. But if you continue to add the specter of the burden of this unfair tax, if we have to pay this much a third time as a family for one ranch, I do not have much optimism for our future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Mr. Surup. I'd like to thank the chairman and Sir, members. I'm sorry, Mr. Sukup. I'd like to thank the chairman and members of the committee for offering me the chance. You might to pull your microphone a little closer, Mr. Sukup. That better? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Eugene Sukup, and I'm founder and chairman of the board of Sukup Manufacturing <laughs> Company. We're a small manufacturing company loaded in she uh, located in Sheffield, Iowa. I started Sukup Manufacturing Company 44 years ago while still working on the farm. I had bought my first grain bin to dry and store shelled corn, but the process didn't work quite right, so I came up with a new design that worked better today. Today I'm proud to say that 40 years after our first item was patented in manufacturing, my sons, Charles and Steve, and I have expanded a single idea into a worldwide company employing over 350 workers in seven states. We now hold over 70 U.S. patents and produce a broad line of grain handling and storage equipment. In addition to our plant in Sheffield, Iowa, we operate six distribution centers. Arcola, Illinois, Aurora, Nebraska, Defiance, Ohio, Jonesboro, Arkansas, Cameron, Missouri, Watertown, South Dakota. We sell products all over the United States and into 40, 50 foreign countries. I firmly believe that one of the reasons and the keys to our company's success is our ability to hire and retain top-notch employees. Over 30 percent of our workers have been with us for more than 10 years. We provide exceptional benefits, including health insurance coverage at no cost for our workers and only $60 per month for their family. In addition, we offer a 401k program, dental health plan, and a profit-sharing program that was started back in 1973. As the largest employer in Franklin County, Iowa, we've watched the community grow around us. Today we have a health clinic, a dentist office, a chiropractor, a drug store, a bank, a grocery store, a restaurant, and golf course. The growth of the town can be seen by the new homes that are being built and a church that has overgrown its uh, capacity and plans for a new one. We believe in giving back to the community, which is why we 
My company is a major donor of the Sheffield Care Center for Senior Citizens. We helped build a local swimming pool and a playground. We also gave a million dollars to help a fund a, a child daycare center that cares for over 100 children in Hampton, Iowa. Sukup Manufacturing Company contributes 10% of its taxable income for charitable contributions for local charities and contributions to the Sukup Family Foundation, which also contributes to area charity. The Family Foundation does not build up a large balance, but uses the money for charitable gifts. The foundation balances over a million dollars, with over 500,000 have been contributed from the foundation in 2006. I'm not bragging when I tell you that the business like Sukup Manufacturing are the backbone of our economy. By the same token, when a business like ours is sold off or the, uh, it's a loss to the economy is great. If Sukup closed today, 350 people would lose their jobs, but that's just the beginning. Without jobs, there's no reason for a child care center. As people move on to other places, the restaurants and stores close down, the dentist office moves to a bigger city with more customers, the loss would be felt in Arkansas and South Dakota. Now, to be clear, we're a growing company, so why would we close down or sell off? I'm here to tell you today that one of the greatest threats to our family-owned business is the estate tax. If my wife Mary and I died today, we estimate that our estate tax liability would be somewhere between 15 and 20 million dollars. The only way for my sons to pay that tax would be to sell off the business. Folks will tell you that you can avoid the tax. Well, maybe that's true in some cases, but it also involves extremely high financial planning costs, including expensive life insurance policies that business pay year in and year out. Money that we put into life insurance policies and other financial planning tools to avoid the tax is money that we could have put into the business, hiring more employees and expanding to other states. Furthermore, it's nearly impossible to plan for a tax that changes every year. Under current law, the exemption for the tax is $2 million, with a top rate of 45 percent. In 2010, the tax is repealed, but in 2011, the top tax rate goes back up to 55 percent, and the exemption drops back down to a million dollars. The uncertainty of the tax means that we have to plan for the worst case, costing us even more money. Even if my sons are able to somehow keep the business after we pass on, my grandchildren will have to pay the same tax again when they take over the company. There's no limit to how many times our company will be taxed. We are truly a family-owned business. I'm fortunate to have two sons working with me who are graduate engineers, two grandchildren that have returned to the company full-time, and two grandchildren who are still attending Iowa State University. One of my grandsons is disabled and has been working at the company running the robot welder. I can't tell you how much it means to me to be able to provide him a job that allows him to make a real contribution to the company and society. I built this company, my sons helped me build it, and my grandchildren want to carry it on. Isn't that the kind of business that our government should encourage? This tax discourages and it destroys family businesses. And it's unfair. I hope that you will all work to permanently end this unfair burden on family-owned businesses like mine. Thank you very much for hearing me today. Thank you, Mr. Suckett, very much. I'm going to begin with Mr. Buffett, um, <laughs> ask a broader question, and that is, um, is, as you look at our country and our tax system and at other countries as how we compare it to other countries, and the goal clearly being uh, to enhance American competitiveness, uh, to help you know, raise American living standards, at least not lower them. Um, our tax structure is only a small part of all that. But um, how would you um, suggest to this committee that we go about um, looking at uh, restructuring the tax code? And I say that because this, I suspect that next year, next couple of years, um, this country will seriously restructure our tax code. Um, um, this committee is going to have very aggressive hearings next year on this subject. Uh, whoever is elected president clearly is going to have some significant suggestions in 2009-10. But uh, let's give that next president the benefit of your views, and let's give this committee the benefit of your views. And uh, what do you think? What should we do? Well, the the, uh, the federal tax system has raised uh, close to 20 percent of our GDP. Fairly consistently. I mean, it's it's varied a point or two, but you know, since World War uh, II, I'm counting all taxes, uh, payroll taxes, and so on. And uh, uh, 
In the 20th century, uh, the United States uh, had the greatest economic period that any, any country's ever seen. The real standard of living improved seven for one. So we do not have a broken system in the United States. I'm, I'm a bull on America over time. We'll have recessions from time to time and all of that. Uh, many industrial company, countries, as you know, have had, had higher tax rates than, than the U.S. But we've, we've had 20, more or less 20 percent. And Everybody that's taxed is unhappy about it, and they'd rather have somebody else. It's like Russell Long said, you know, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the fellow behind the tree. And we all feel that way. Uh, but the countries work pretty well with the 20 percent uh, allocation uh, to the federal government. If you asked me what my druthers would be if I thought I was designing a perfect system, uh, I would have a very progressive consumption tax. I really think I would tax the people who use the resources or making withdrawals from society's resources and, and really not tax the people who are, who are uh, contributing, making deposits to society's resources. So I think that, in theory, a progressive consumption tax makes the most sense, but I don't see how you get there from here. So absent that, uh, I would say that uh, uh, the level of revenues, which I think should come close to approximating the level of expenditures, I mean, you, you, when you've decided on the expenditures, then you, your job is to go out and get the money. And uh, I think it, a 20% a, a uh, is not, it's not a crippling uh, level to uh, assess uh, the American people for all the things that the American people demand of their national government. Uh, I would make it somewhat more progressive. I would take that bottom fifth of the people. I mean, if you've got 23 million households at 20,000 or less, you know, I don't know how I would, I mean, uh, there, I'll, I'll hear some tough problems around here, maybe in terms of, of family businesses and that sort of thing, but I can't imagine a tougher problem than living in the United States and having a $20,000 income and having payroll taxes of $3,000 uh, taken out of that income. So I would, I, would, I would make it more progressive than it is now. And what, how would you include a state tax reform? You don't want to repeal it, so what would you do with the federal state tax? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything that, that raise less than the 24 billion, like I say, that's an historical low almost as a percentage of the revenues. I would probably have a, I certainly wouldn't have the capriciousness of, of one year this and one year that. I mean, I think that's terrible, and I don't know how anybody does plan for something like that, and it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, it may have helped on some scoring system a long time ago, but that's about it. Uh, now, I would have a significant deduction probably along the lines of what happens in 2009. And I would have a much more of a sloped uh, 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 set of rates. I would not have it kick in at maximum rates at a low level. But I would, I would say that it is in the, it's in the tradition of America. Part of what Amer made, has made America what it has is we've had more equality of opportunity in this country. I mean, you don't get to be quarterback of the Nebraska football team this year because your father was quarterback 25 years ago. You don't get to be on the Olympic team because your mother or father was on it 25 years ago. And the resources of society, I don't think, should pass along in terms of an arist aristocratic uh, uh, dynasty of wealth. Uh, and, and I think that's been part of the reason for the success of our economy, that the you know, the people like that Jack Welch or something where his father was a train conductor can rise to command the resources. So I, 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 I believe in a, I believe in keeping equality of opportunity as much as you can in the country. My kids are going to have it better than the kids of a poor person, no matter what the tax laws are. I mean, they're around a different environment. They get to go to college, all kinds of things. But I don't think the tax, I think the tax, I think when you have $45,000 of GDP per capita in the United States, that that bottom fifth, 23 million households, 50 million plus people, 20,000 or less income. I think we ought to do more for them, and I think we ought to take a little more out of the hides of fellows like me and that Forbes 400 that have got their 1.54 trillion up seven for one, you know, and who on average I think are paying a lower tax rate, counting payroll taxes to the federal government than their receptionists are. I think you ought to do something about them. Thank you, Mr. Buffett. I have many more questions, but my time's expired. So, Mr. Grassley. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of transparency, I want to say that uh, my farm has all souk-up grain handling equipment on it, so he, he's not only a good business person and I trust him, he's also been a good friend and political supporter as well. Uh, so Mr. Sukup, uh, 
uh, your testimony reflects that you and your family and your employees have already used many of the estate planning tools that Mr. Titel talked about, but I understand you still may have to consider selling the company because of the estate tax flow. I know that you've discussed uh, who could purchase a green bin manufacturing company. Could you talk about the impact of that potential sale and who, or more importantly, where would the green bin manufacturing go if it uh, perhaps would leave Sheffield, Iowa? Senator, I think that, uh, you know, this is a real problem that uh, we could uh, have to sell the business. Our sons might have to sell the business. And it will probably go to a competitor or, or overseas. You never know exactly where it will go. But for them to come up with 15 uh, to $20 million to continue is a real burden. It's something that they're not used to, uh, borrowing money like that. And it is uh, probably a competitor. And uh, Mr. Buffett is one of our competitors. He owns Brock of Manufacturing. And so consequently, uh, if we had to sell in nine months as it goes, I mean, that's a fire sale. And that's what uh, other people have made their money on, is making buying companies like small business companies when they are in a fire sale like that. Uh, Mr. Buffett, if you did buy it, would you leave it in Sheffield, Iowa, or would you move it, or, or would you, or would Certainly you? What now, Senator? <laughs> oh, okay. the, uh, yeah, we, uh, as, as, as Mr. Tuka mentioned, he's, and he's a terrific competitor. We, we own a company called CTB, which is based in Indiana, and, and not only, we bought that a, about five years ago. They make hog and poultry feeding equipment as well as grain bins. They make a lot of grain bins. My son actually worked with a grain bin company in Illinois, GSI. Uh, we not only uh, didn't touch any plants, I mean, we expanded a little, but every plant that was operating then, there's more people employed than before. The, the plants are all in the same place. And you might find that as interesting. We probably bought it five years ago. I've never been there. Uh, nobody from our office has been there except probably the auditors go occasionally. And the people run that business exactly as they ran that business before, except they have even added resources behind them. And we have bought some other companies. They've, they've generally been abroad. So with, we actually are a domestic company that buys, buys foreign companies uh, in that business. Okay. Uh, Mr. Buffett, I want to take advantage of your being here to get your view on a, another issue sometimes coming before this committee. I am f uh, sure you're familiar with the current debate surrounding carried interest. I'm a strong supporter of lower rates on capital gains. I'm still studying the carried interest issue, haven't made up my mind. What are your views on whether carried interest received and, uh, by alternative asset managers represents compensation for services or capital gains? And secondly, are your views on carried interest influenced in any way by your general views on the lower capital gains rate? Senator, from 1956, to 1969, for 14 years, I ran an investment partnership. Uh, I had a carried interest in that. The rates were higher then, but I had a carried interest. I was managing money for other people. I could have managed it at a trust department, and we would have charged them a fee. I could have ma managed it as an investment counselor, and we would have charged them a fee. I elected to go with a partnership form, and in effect, I received a large percentage of my income from capital gains. The gains rate was higher then, but there was a wide differential. So I've had a little experience with it. I can tell you whether I was managing money in a trust department or whether I was managing money as an investment counselor or whether I was managing money as the general partner of an investment partnership, sometimes called hedge funds, uh, I was doing the same activity. I was working the same hours. I was working for the same people. Believe me, it's just a, it's, it's an occupation. And if you believe in taxing people, as earned income on their occupation, I think you should tax people on carried interest. Okay. Mr. Buffett, on another point of interest to this, me and this committee, there's a part of your charitable donations that uh, doesn't get much notice but has caught my attention. You have been very direct that the money you give to foundations should be spent within a set period of time and actually go to help those in need and improve the community. You're basically requiring spending of your gifts at far above the 5% minimum set by law. I commend you for your actions in this regard. As I think you're aware, private foundations are required to only pay out 5% and university endowments have no requirement 
uh, to pay out anything. We're seeing a growing phenomena that in both cases, we're seeing billions and billions of dollars stockpiled by foundations and university endowments, all getting very significant tax breaks, but only pennies actually going to charities or helping those in need. What are your thoughts on this general subject, and what suggestions do you have for Congress in this area, both for foundations and university endowments, should we be uh, should we do more to encourage increased spending for charity? Well, Senator, I'll tell you what I believe on it. I, I, uh, uh, I looked at the spending of the 30 largest foundations in the United States. I've looked at it for several years. And if you take the 30 largest, at least 27 every year, 28 some years, spend right at the 5% or a little less. Now, it's astounding to me that frankly, that the Congress should have been so wise as to pick exactly the right amount for foundations to uh, spend. I mean, the idea that that 5 percent should be the end result of a foundation looking at its objectives, the reasons it was set up, and all that sort of thing, the time horizon of the problems they're working on, whatever, and that they would all come up with the idea that exactly 5 percent of their principal is the right amount to spend strikes me as absurd. I mean, it's driven by the tax law. It's not driven by the, by, uh, the logic of philanthropic uh, distribution. I think if you set it at 3%, I think most of them would spend 3%. I'm, I don't blame the people. It's what I call institutional dynamics. I mean, once any organ, large organization gets set up and it gets funding, it starts subconsciously probably thinking about just perpetuating itself forever. I see it in business. I see it every place. I mean, it isn't limited to philanthropy at all. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Senator Senator Wyden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, I think it's pretty clear there is a tax code meltdown coming very shortly. We're looking today at just the question of state taxes. But I think this has to come up in the context also of income tax rates, capital gains, and, and dividends. And suffice it to say, if this committee doesn't come up with a thoughtful response here. There's just going to be chaos in the uh, world of taxes. So I think it's obvious we want to promote growth, we want predictability, and we want certainty in terms of the next steps in taxes. My question really revolves around the fact that in 1986, we had a pretty good model of how to proceed. Ronald Reagan and Bill Bradley came together and they said, here's something that gives everybody the chance to get ahead. Everybody. It's not class warfare. It's given everybody a chance to get ahead. So I've introduced the Fair Flat Tax Act. Essentially, same principles. Get rid of the tax breaks, keep progressivity, clean out the clutter. My question for each of you, start with you, Mr. Buffett, is wouldn't it make sense to look at something like that because that also moves in the direction of what the small farmers and the small businesses have been talking about. You go to a fair flat tax, clean out all these special interest breaks, maybe make it harder to add them back in, and then you've got some certainty and predictability, which the farmers and the small business people want, and the chance for everybody to get ahead. Mr. Title, you won't be revising your planning books every year if the fair flat tax or something like it goes through. Wouldn't that be a pretty good model? Start with you, Mr. Buffett, go down the line to at least attack part of the problem that the farmers and the small business people, I think, are very legitimately talking about. Mr. Buffett? I, I cheered what Bill Bradley did, and it didn't last long, as you, as you know. Uh, I don't believe in being flat all the way. I mean, I, I, I think fair flat tax. Uh, uh, yeah, it should be. It should be progressive, but it should be. I, I, I like the Bradley plan, and and uh, like I say, it didn't last long. I, I would say this: uh, there is one flat tax that quits. I mean, this, the payroll tax, which is a third of our total budget, is flat. You know, up to ninety-seven thousand five hundred, and then it quits for me. So at, at fifteen point three percent, you know, right from the word go, uh, and then. That tax at 97.5, I mean, 98.9% of my income does not get taxed to that. So I think that I think anything you do should also con consider the impact of the Social Security and the payroll tax, because that's a huge element of what most people are paying in this country. But I, I'm with you in principle. Mr. Title? Uh, Senator, may I um, answer your question by um, just quoting a legendary uh, 
politician to begin with, and then you'll, I hope you'll see how this fits into my answer. <clears throat> he was asked his position on whiskey, and he responded, if by whiskey you mean the devil's brew that has wrecked millions of marriages, taken the bread from the mouths of hungry children, and has toppled countless men and women from the pinnacle of righteousness, then I'm against it. But if by whiskey you mean the oil of convivial conversation, the traditional expression of Christmas cheer, the source of millions of tax dollars for orphans, disabled children, and the blind, then I am for it. This is my position, and I will not compromise. So Now, do you know who uh, the author of that quote was, sir? If you go to the um, uh, Congressional Research uh, Service, uh, they have a wonderful book called Respectfully Quoted. And, well, uh, it, it actually came from a fellow named Soggy Sweat, uh, who was uh, a lawyer and a judge in Mississippi. I just thought I'd tell you where it came from. I was pretty sure, Mr. Title, it didn't come from Ronald Reagan and Bill Bradley. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks for the, uh, for the, for the citation. Um, to, an to answer your question, uh, Senator, I'm really of, of two minds, because if by the flat tax you mean uh, a rate a uh, flat rate with no deductions. No, then fair, something along the lines of what Ronald Reagan and Bill Bradley put together that went from 14 to 28, essentially was fair to the person who worked for a wage and the investor and paid for it by cleaning out the clutter. Well, what, what do you mean by the clutter? Do you mean the... Um, the 16,000 tax mean, breaks that have been added, three for every working day since Ronald Reagan and Bill Bradley did that. Do you mean the mortgage interest deduction? No, I, I protect that and health and charity, but there have been 16,000 tax breaks. Can't we clean some of those out to hold down the rates and keep progressivity and give everybody a chance to get ahead? Senator, I quite agree with you. I just remember one hearing when they were uh, talking about uh, reducing or disallowing the deduction for the so-called three martini lunch. Do you know who came and testified to keep that uh, deduction for 100 percent for the business lunch, the waiters union. So uh, sometimes there are side effects. I quite agree with you. We should clear out the clutter. Senator Kyle. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We could, I, 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 could, uh, I think we could all benefit from uh, having these uh, witnesses talk to us all day long. This is most uh, elucidating, and I thank you for holding the hearing, incidentally. Um, uh, just let me note a couple of things I thought were especially interesting from testimony. Mr. Sukup, uh, you said a couple of things I thought were really important to just reiterate. Um, th the first is that you could have, instead of putting a lot of money into estate planning, into purchasing of life insurance and the like, put that back into your business and built it even bigger and had even more employees and so on. And uh, Correct? Senator, that's right. Uh, I, I won't ask you how much money you spend on life insurance, but would you characterize it at least in general terms? Uh, we didn't spend a lot of money in uh, life insurance. We plowed our money back into the company. That's why we were able to grow like we have been. And it really concerns me that uh, we would have 350 people. We're in a local small town that may have to move out uh, to a different area in case our company would have to be sold and was uh, sent to a competitor or to uh, someplace else. In the world. Right. Now, you also said that uh, you've got uh, kids and grandkids and sound very proud of them, and you made the point that there's no limit on how many times our business will be taxed. Is, That's is right. The way you put it. I mean, you can go to Each 45 generation. percent or 50 percent, and when uh, Mary and I pass away, uh, Charles and Steve will have to dig up t 15 to 20 million, and the same thing's going to happen when it goes to our grandchildren. We are so fortunate that we have grandchildren that want to come back to the company to run it, and they're there now, mm -hmm. and they're enthused about it, which is maybe unusual, but it is, we are very fortunate. Now, I, I think you all know the answer to this question, but Mr. Titel, you're probably the most authoritative to provide the answer. Do corporations uh, pay taxes in a similar way uh, at the death of the CEO or some event like that? Well, the corporation does not pay, pay a tax. Of course not. Right. But a family-owned business is generational. In other words, the, the tax does apply each generation. Is that, is that correct? Well, it applies to the owner of the, the business. At, yes. at, yeah. At, at the time that the previous generational owner dies parent, grandparent, whatever it is, then it applies to those who 
or left. Senator Kyle, may I uh, frame the issue that we're all Please describe about? it in more, more specific uh, and humorous me, terms uh, than I did. I'd like to no, know. Uh, you've described it uh, admirably all along, but I'd like to frame the issue by going back to that uh, whiskey uh, politician and just update it to what we're talking about here uh, today. So if you were asked about his position on the estate tax, he no doubt, no doubt would respond, if by the estate tax you mean a tax that punishes hard work, prevents people from passing the fruits of their labor on to their heirs, and forces the sale of farms and small businesses, then I am against it. Well, you can stop right there. <laughs> <laughs> if the senator will yield, may I just finish? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, but, if, but if by the estate tax you mean the source of essential revenues for the federal government to serve our citizens, a crucial supplement to the funds needed by the states for the general good, and the way to prevent, as you said, uh, Mr. Buffett, an aristocracy of inheritance, then I am for it. So basically, those are the two sides of the uh, argument. And this committee, in its wisdom, has to find whether you go one way or the other, or sure. I'm sure you're going to end up uh, somewhere in between. Just for the record, uh, Mr. Buffett, you're talking about uh, roughly 20 percent uh, in taxation, 20 percent of our economy uh, being uh, revenue to the federal government. Actually, um, and I just checked, uh, the 40-year average is 18.2 percent, and we're currently collecting 18.8 percent. And on a $13.9 trillion economy, even 1 percent is a, is a heck of a lot of money. Yeah, so um, I, I, part of it, too, I suspect, uh, is a debate between those who would have the government taking even more income from uh, our families and workers uh, than it is today. Uh, versus those, uh, and I count myself in the group that would say we've, uh, we're, it, it, the government does not lack for money, and uh, we shouldn't be collecting an even higher percentage. I, I wanted. I, I don't uh, disagree with you on that. Uh, okay, and there's something else I know you don't disagree on because you said it, and I'll I'll quote from your most recent uh, Berkshire Hathaway letter to shareholders talking about a business that you uh, purchased an electronics distributor from Fort Worth. And you talked about how Paul loves running his business. He's a remarkable entrepreneur. But not long ago, he happened to witness how disruptive the death of a founder can be, both to a private company's employees and to the owner's family. What starts out as disruptive furthermore often evolves into destructive. And uh, you wrote that uh, to note how you had purchased uh, his business and you've purchased uh, many other family uh, businesses and uh, I appreciate the fact that you've kept those family businesses going so the employees don't get laid off but I also think you'd agree that in most of those cases the families would prefer to run their own business than to have it purchased by somebody else actually, actually that that case I referred to though that was that was squabbling among the family that, that was not called, oh, I, I, called by okay. taxes uh, uh, oftentimes they don't agree on which one should run the business yeah. subsequently or a lot of things uh, we have bought we've bought one business in Seattle Washington Ben Bridge fourth generation I uh, People who manage their businesses through. What I do find kind of interesting sometimes is they, if they do decide to sell their businesses to us, we look at the figure they put on their estate tax return for the business, and that is not the figure they think the business is worth the day after the return it, becomes final. It's the American way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Senator Bunny. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sokup, uh, I was inspired uh, by your story right here. Uh, about uh, uh, your invention that that led to the start of your business over 44 years ago. Some economists have said that business owners don't care that much about leaving a legacy or passing on a business to their heirs. They say that business owners build wealth primarily for themselves. But you testified today about your grandchildren and those in your family that you think would like to stay in the business and inherit the business from you and your grandchildren are working in the business also. My question is, how many times do you have to pay the same estate tax to retain the business in your family? You would... Senator, you would have to continue. I mean, it goes uh, from the, as soon as the children, uh, our sons pay the tax, 
The grandchildren will have to pay the Are price. they also in the business like you are? Yes, they are. We are very fortunate. They are. We have three of them working in the business now. Two are in college, and they're hoping that they come back to the business. Well, I, I can give you chapter on verse on a, a small horse farm in Scott County, Kentucky, that had a $12 million uh, tag estate on it, uh, $4 million estate tax. They, they sold, or they tried to make it go, they sold, uh, hawk, hawked the farm to a bank, 37 mares and a couple brood mares, and guess what? It didn't produce enough income and or interest to pay the debt. The bank took over, and the $12 million estate was completely lost because of the estate tax. Now, this was the original estate tax, not the improved estate tax that we now have. But I don't believe the estate tax was ever designed to confiscate wealth like you have created and your community has prospered by. Thank and I don't think anybody on this panel believes that that's the case either. That we think you should be able to survive as a small business person. But we need some direction because come 2011, if we don't have that direction, we're going to go right back to where we were in 2000. And 2000. So can you give us some direction? Just to repeal the death tax is uh, repeal it. That's it. Yeah. Well, we can't get that done. We've been trying to, we've been trying to make a compromise, where we can get a certain amount on the uh, spouse and and the uh, owner and the spouse uh, at a certain level, and tax the rest of the estate at a certain level also. And we cannot come to a compromise. Uh, and we ought to be able to come to a compromise because I don't think uh, we were ever intended to confiscate uh, the wealth that has been created. Now, certain members of our society are able to escape estate tax because they have enough dollars and planning people to escape all estate taxes. God bless them. I, I give them credit for that ability. But the average American cannot. And if only 12% is covered by estate tax, then those 12% ought to be able to uh, do something in regards to their own estate. You're, you're absolutely right, Mr. Buffett. Uh, uh, very few people are gathering. But when we go back in 2011, a lot more are going to fall under those those auspices of a million dollars and then less. I do not recommend going back in 2011 to what the schedule. I, I, uh, I think that was an abomination, actually. Well, I, I can remember when uh, we, we talked about uh, income. Um, I still have 25 seconds. You I do. can remember when income tax rates were at 70%. Can you all remember that? I, I remember so. when they were at 91%. Well, I only remember 70. I got stuck. <laughs> at 70% when I started in baseball. And I can tell you this, $5,000 a year, uh, that was the minimum salary at the time. Uh, I got a big raise to $14,000 a year because I won 20 games. Uh, that, didn't, that didn't get me into the 70% bracket right away. But if you got up to $40,000, you were in the 70% bracket. And that's unusual, and we ought not go back there because we don't think that we should go past what Senator Kyle said, 18.2, 18.3 of the GDP coming in. I think that's a fair amount to spend on our federal government expenditures. Senator Smith. Thank you. Senator Thank Smith. you for your input. Thank you. I just mentioned one figure on that. The, the 18 and a fraction is what comes in, but closer to 20 goes out. The, uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the real amount that the uh, government raises, yeah, borrowing plus taxes. Thank you, Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you all for being here. Um, I must tell you, there's probably few issues I've encountered in, uh, in Congress that divide the parties more than the, just the view about government's role in redistribution. My, I'll acknowledge my own bias. I think freedom redistributes better than um, 
uh, than government central planning, and uh, usually when money gets to the third generation, it's redistributed through profligate living. Uh, whether that's better done by bringing it into government, I guess we each have to make a value judgment. My own experience as a small businessman, um, not, under, not unlike Mr. Asuka, in a small rural community in Oregon, uh, has taught me that in order to uh, pass on to my heirs what my wife and I have built, we spend an extraordinary amounts on lawyers, accountants, insurance policies, in the hope that there is something that uh, when we die um, won't be carved up by a big firm on Wall Street and leave a community very, very desperate. And I think, uh, Mr. Buffett, I must say I am a huge fan of yours. And I mean no disrespect in my views towards you. Uh, my concern, though, is exactly the point between these two ends of the table, that big Wall Street firms can go after companies like that and carve them up and leave rural communities in very desperate shape. And I've seen it. And it's driven by the estate tax. And I don't want to see it anymore in America. And I think that the money that I've spent in my life, if I could spend it on some cows or doing something to keep investing in my community and my business and the enterprise that employs a thousand people, that that is money better spent than bringing it here. Because that's, it's going to go one of two places. It's going to stay home or it's coming here. And if you like how we spend it, bring it here. My own experience is it's better spent when it's left at home. But that really brings me to you, Mr. Uh, Title. You're the expert. We're trying to craft a compromise. I don't think Mr. Buffett wants to take his company. I don't think that at all. But how do I make sure somebody else doesn't take his company? And what is the compromise we ought to, as Americans, not as Republicans or as Democrats, strike so that people in that situation, small businesses, aren't forced because of death to sell to big businesses? Realistic um, exemptions, realistic uh, rates, and under current law, there's special use value for a uh, farm or a ranch, and there's also the ability to uh, pay taxes if you meet certain tests on, on a small business or even a larger business over 15 years, perhaps at a lower interest rate in many cases. So perhaps that could be uh, revisited. And um, I was uh, taken by the importance of passing down the, um, the, the business. And I know this, there isn't a uh, Senate committee that, that deals with this, uh, but what um, Mr. Buffett has done and what the two of you have done with your philanthropy, in addition to passing down the business, I know in our law office, we talk about all of the, the generation skipping trusts and the grant or retained annuity trusts and uh, irrevocable life insurance trusts and, and the like. But then we also talk about passing down values, um, the value of philanthropy. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are family meetings to, to talk about uh, that. So I think, uh, although that's not the, the, the um, charge of this committee, I just wanted to say, say that. That's equally uh, Im important. Well, I hope you'll help us write a bill. And I, Mr. Chairman, I, 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 I really do think that for the sake of small business, if America is about small business, we ought to be about coming up with a deal on estate taxes. Because I can't think of many things more disruptive to the growing of small business so that they can become business rather than the forced sale of small businesses to big businesses. I just think it's bad public policy. And uh, I really think it's incumbent upon us to um, come up with a compromise. I know Senator Kyle and you have worked on it. We ought to do it for our country's sake. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. You're right. Um, this is an abomination, the current situation. And the sooner we correct it, some reasonable way, because nobody's going to agree. Don't every, wait too long. I, every, I dotted T cross, but some reasonable way because to get this thing handled. Mr. Rockefeller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to associate myself completely with what Mr. Buffett said, associate myself with some confusion with what the rest of you said, and um, make a couple of points. 
first is a sort of philosophical one as far as I'm concerned, which I think you made. A couple of months ago, I was, somebody asked me to go to the 86th floor of some building in New York City. And uh, I walked in <clears throat> to the room, excuse my voice, and um, he glared at me. Now, this was his invitation. And I sat down, um, and he continued just to glare at me. And somehow, we had to start a conversation. So I decided to start it in the following manner. I said, how much money are you going to make this year? And he said, $183 million. And then he came back and said something very interesting. He said, but I could be making more if you people on the Finance Committee would do something about deferred compensation. I then said to him, in what was a total of about a four-minute meeting, um, how, do I, how do I hold something called America in my hand? And you're making 183, and I'm sure you work hard for it. And the average income of a family in West Virginia, four, which pays taxes, works extraordinarily hard, is always scared financially. Um, is around $26,500. How do I do that? How do I, do I call it income disparity? Do I say that, that merit will always rise and that if you're sort of born in West Virginia somehow, uh, you can't? It's not true. We have Ray Lanes and people all over the place who come from West Virginia and done very well. But to me, it was a very interesting conversation about the, the mood of America in these last uh, 10 years. Second thing I want to say is I very much agree with what Ron Wyden said when he was here, that there's going to have to be some major tax readjustment. Uh, these last seven years have done as much damage to America as any that I can think of in my numbers of years of life. Uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure, research, medical discoveries, and all the rest of it. And it, to me, that has sucked the, the strength out of America psychologically and out of entrepreneur, entrepreneurship and out of investigation, out of NIH, National Science Foundation, all the rest of it in gargantuan ways. Because we cut taxes by, because the, the war was going on and, and that was taking a lot of attention. So in the meantime, all these taxes, tax cuts were being passed, which benefited fundamentally the people that you have been talking about, along with my Uncle David. And um, they're just, you know, Nobody, everybody forgot that there was a whole other section of people out there who, who don't buy Bing Crosby's ranch. You know, my heart kind of didn't bleed a lot when you said that. Um, and they're just struggling to make it. I have a, um, a friend in West Virginia who every year comes up, and he's a farmer, and he complains to me about the estate tax. Now, he doesn't say the estate tax. He always says the death tax. And I think you've mentioned that, but I missed that part because I walked in late. Well, that's a brilliant maneuver, which is used by some on this committee. Because if you say a death tax, that means that when you die, you pay a tax. And um, of course, nothing could be necessarily further from the truth. So after about five years of these visits, which never changed in content, I said, OK, I'm going to go to the IRS, the actual IRS, and I'm going to get out their books. And I'm going to turn to the year 2005, because this happened in 2006. And um, when he came that year, in 2005, I said that I have not made up figures. I've simply gone to the IRS in terms of their predictions. I guess it was a 2006, looking back at 2005. And there were 100 West Virginians 
who would, um, you know, pay more if the estate tax was repealed or would benefit. And across the country, of 300 million people, there are 9,000. And I put this in letter form, asked him to respond, to give his side of the argument, never heard from him. Final thing I want to say is that the, what nobody ever talks about is if we did this, it would cost a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars isn't much these days on tax cuts. Uh, we do it so regularly, and the, the lust for more tax cuts is always there. Unfortunately, it, it usually goes to the people that you and I are talking about, and it doesn't go to the people who, in my judgment, need it. I, I come from West Virginia. I get very angry about that. I'm not, I'm not talking from a broad societal point of view. I'm talking about the people I represent, and I get very, very angry when they get uh, they got the short end of the stick when my friend, former friend, up on the 86th floor is complaining about deferred compensation. And yes, I'm almost finished. Um, so while we were doing all of this, then we, we got all these skipped years. You know, it fades in this year, comes back that year. Nobody paid any attention. We did it all just so that it could be sort of disguised in, in the budget and not look too... Uh, too dangerous. I think this country is in real trouble. I think we, we just happen at, to have reached that particular point in our country where we have to re remake pretty much the general nature of our country okay, from education sure. and science yeah, to you. values and and thank you. We'll, we'll solve that in the future. <laughs> thank you. Senator Salazar. Thank you very much uh, Chairman Bacchus and thank you for uh, keeping your uh, promise to hold a, a hearing on estate tax reform. I want to ask a couple of questions. Um, uh, first, to uh, Mr. Buffett. Um, and as a background, let me just say, uh, you know, my own involvement in this as a, as a farmer and rancher and a family who's been on the same farm now for 150 years, I'm not sure uh, the estate tax, uh, frankly, has been so coined as uh, the death tax uh, adroitly by some people who uh, are opposed to, to the tax, whatever hit. 99.99% uh, .99 of our farms and ranches in Colorado, including ours, uh, because it just doesn't have that kind of value where there's going to be that kind of a reach. So I agree with Senator Rockefeller that those who are opponents of this have been, have been very successful in terms of uh, putting the label on it that essentially uses a lot of people uh, in a political debate on what really ought to be a, a good debate on the principles that we're debating here, uh, which include the, the issue of fiscal responsibility. I also, Mr. Buffett, as you, as you and I have talked about, my wife was uh, an owner-operator for a long time of a Dairy Queen franchise and still has the best uh, ice cream in the, in the country. But let me ask you this, uh, Mr. Buffett. The, end, the reality of it is I don't think there's going to be a repeal of the estate tax here, uh, but there's going to be a reform, and uh, I think that's what you have been an, adv an advocate of. And so tell us what you specifically would recommend to this Finance Committee in terms of the components of that reform, which uh, from my point of view include the amount of the exemption for an estate, so small estates come out, to what the rate of the tax should be uh, in terms of whatever you, you think we, we ought to go for, and then third, any other issues including the issue of indexing. How would you advise us as a committee and as the United States Senate to move forward on the issue? I would probably have today an exemption of about $4 million. I would certainly have it indexed. I would have the slope be more gradual above that $4 million, but I would have it end up at higher than 45%, and I would certainly not have it raise a less than the $24 billion that it's raising now. But uh, uh, in 1987, again, there was one individual on the Forbes list that had more than five billion. There are now 63 that have more than five billion. If you invest five billion at seven or a fraction percent a year, and these people know how to do that, that's a million dollars a day. Uh, in terms of passing on dynasties of wealth, I really think the rate ought to be a lot higher than 45 percent. And uh, but I would I would go much easier in the early stages above the four million dollar exemption. And like I say, I would have that I would have that indexed. Uh, and I think, I think you could do something like that. And, well, 
1,500 of the estates paid half the, uh, the estate tax. I mean, you're, so you, you're only talking 1,500 people, that, and these are people that are inheriting tens of millions of dollars uh, uh, in those particular cases. Uh, so you would, you would hit very, very, very few people. And uh, Let me ask you this question. If sure. we're, so I, I, we may end up uh, moving forward in, in that kind of a direction. I'm not sure. We'll see how, how this all turns out. But do, do you, uh, in, in, term, in terms of people who are at your range of, of, of wealth who uh, actually uh, have to deal with these issues of estate tax, do you think that uh, we could get a number of those people to support that kind of, of reform? Let me ask you this question. Really, this is my question. The, the issue of certainty and uncertainty, uh, how big is that an issue uh, for uh, people who have to deal with the estate tax issue? Is the that issue a more of certainty? Yes. I think it's enormously important. I, I don't think people should have to guess at what year they're going to die. And right now we're guessing, so it would be it would be much more important for us to whether it's reform, repeal, whatever it is that we do, but that we essentially have the long-term roadmap for anybody uh, to be able to plan. Yeah, I'd I mean, put it to bed for a while. <laughs> I mean, I think enough. There's been enough uncertainty and confusion created, so I what, whatever I did, I would put it to bed for a while. <laughs> okay, let me just uh, don't want to run my time over my time too much here, but Mr. Rhodes as a as a rancher. Uh, one of the concerns uh, I very much have is uh, what happens to family farms and family ranches and uh, the situation that I know a few examples of in Colorado where uh, family farms and ranches have had to be sold in order to pay the estate tax. We had some kind of a reform along the way that uh, uh, Mr. Buffett has testified along with uh, an exemption that is specific to family farms and ranches so that if they continue on as operational farms and ranches uh, by the heirs, and we exempt those estates from taxation, it seems to me that would be a useful move in the right direction. And Senator Crapo and Senator Roberts and Senator Feinstein and I have introduced legislation that would be specific as to these farms and ranches. Uh, what, what's your view on our move in that direction? Yes, I would certainly support that effort, and I have in the past, and uh, it's something that, that we, we fully need because we've we went through two generations now and have ended up paying 640000 And And uh, when I die and my wife die, we're going to go through one more. So I would certainly support something like that, and I believe the National Cattlemen Association does also. Senator, can I make one suggestion on that? Sir. Uh, just yeah. throwing out an idea, and i just mm -hmm. coming up with it now, but you could have the, the government assess at the normal, whatever the normal rates would be at the time of death or it's being left to a family. You could have interest on that accrue, but never have it be collectible until, until the farm left the family. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. at, at that point, all this appreciation that takes place in land and everything, sure. the, the government would get its money with interest, mm -hmm. but get it when it left the family. I see. Yeah, I could live with that. Well, th thank you very much, and uh, you've been a, a stellar panel. And thank you again, Chairman Bacchus, for this very interesting hearing. You bet. Thank you very much. Uh, next on the list is um, Sarah Lincoln. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Certainly appreciate you and, and our ranking member, Senator Grassley, uh, for holding this hearing. Um, it's, I've been passionate about this issue for years, and I think we in Washington have left far too many of our family businesses in a quagmire as a result of the erratic um, estate tax policy that we set in 2001, and I think that that is as much um, certainly in agreement on this panel is that certainty is an incredibly important part to any business, whether it's a family-owned business or a, um, a, a large, huge business, um, but it, it's critically important to our family-owned businesses and farms. Um, and they've spent tens of thousands of dollars each year in planning for the tax, and, and the status quo is unacceptable. And I hope that through uh, what we're doing here in the committee, uh, both today and continuing onward, that we can come up with something that's going to be um, you know, ultimately leading to a committee product that uh, modernizes our estate tax um, portion of the code and really clears up the current uncertainty in those rates and exemption structures that are so important um, to have certainty to them. Um, my questions, I have several. Um, Mr. Titel, thank you for your testimony. Um, in it, you've kind of provided an overview of the numerous estate planning considerations that families currently face when they go through this erratic estate tax policy. Um, most of the, um, we recognize that the largest number of estates that are filing estate tax returns are in the one to $2.5 million range. I believe that's around 75, 70 percent of the returns uh, are filed in that range. Um, 
um, isn't it true that when you look at the vast majority of those filers right now, they wouldn't have to plan? If we had a reasonable rate, I know Mr. Buffett's mentioned $4 million, but anyway, if we had a reasonable rate there, um, the key here would be that we would take out the bulk of the individuals, particularly family-owned businesses and, and what have you, um, that are really being strapped by that. And the follow-up question to that would be um, that although the majority of the filers are in the smaller states, in terms of the actual estate tax revenue, which I think Mr. Buffett seems to focus on as well, um, that's the coming into the coffers, more than 40 percent of it comes from large estates, which are estates over the 10 million value. Um, and so for those estates, uh, which are going to be protected by the exemption, it's important that we set a fair rate. Um, and uh, Mr. Buffett, I noticed you mentioned that you would not be supportive of going back to pre-2001 rates. Um, so to both of you gentlemen, um, you know, if we come up with something reasonable, we knock out the majority of those, that, the 70 percent that are filing now that really don't need to be um, and are spending a lot of resources that they could be investing in their businesses, as Mr. Sukup mentions, um, and then putting in a reasonable rate. Does that I mean, I'm hoping that's the direction you're going to tell us to go in. Oh, I think she directed you. <laughs> Senator, you've answered your own uh, question. Certainly for the state I of want you to answer it, though. <laughs> I know where I am. Well, let <laughs> I've me, been fighting for well, it. I, I, I agree with you. Uh, for the estate of one or two or three million dollars, certainly a uh, more realistic exemption would cover that and um, indexed, uh, as um, Mr. Buffett says, right. for inflation because otherwise what's good today might not be good eight or nine years or five years uh, from now. As far as the so-called larger estates, so let's say $10 million and way, way, way above that, in my travels around the, the country and in our law practice, our wealthier clients, of course, they, when they come to our office, they want to make sure that they get their parking tickets validated. So they, <laughs> they, they, they care about Every, everything, but they don't really, they like the exemption, that's nice, but that's really not important. Right, there could be a minus exemption as far as somebody who has 50 million, 100 million and on above. It's really the rate, to paraphrase Shakespeare, the rate is the thing. <laughs> and that's, that's where, it, where you have your work cut out for you. Oh yeah. Thank you, Mr. Buffett. I, you, you definitely said you didn't, uh, did I hear you correctly, that you, you didn't yeah. think we should go back to pre-2001, is that no. correct? Um, Mr. Rhodes, as, as the daughter of a seventh generation farm family in, in our state of Arkansas, I'm certainly appreciative of your testimony and understand the tremendous feeling of pride that you must feel, uh, not just for maintaining, but, but building upon the work uh, of those who came before you. Uh, I watched my father as a rice farmer in the Mississippi Delta of Arkansas take tremendous pride in caring for his land and what he produced, um, more importantly, um, making sure that it would be there for future generations. And I think that's really important. Uh, it's an important part of who we are as Americans. Um, and Mr. S um, uh, Sukup, the fact that you have two children and two grandchildren um, working in your business and who want to be there, I think that that's a tremendous, there's one thing my mother said to me when I ran for Congress. It is, she says, please do something up there that will make our children want to stay at home in these small rural communities. You know, provide them the business and the wherewithal to be able to stay here um, and not have to leave and go to the big cities and uh, what have you. So um, I was hoping that either one of you gentlemen might elaborate a little bit on how often you have to reassess your will. Uh, very briefly, please. Uh, your time has expired, Senator. Very briefly. Uh, we look at it uh, every uh, year or two to see what we can do or if the changes in the laws and things like that so mm -hmm. that we can update it. Yeah, we, we do it the same way. We, um, every two or three years, we got another grandchild or something like that, and we try to include them in. Mm -hmm. so, about it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If, I don't know if we're going to have a Thanks, second Senator. round, but yeah, I do have we'll one have, more we'll question. Have, we'll have some time, Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for participating in today's panel. Mr. Buffett, thank you for that investment in Washington State businesses, and thank you for the pledge to uh, uh, a great uh, use of your funds to the Gates Foundation in the future. I, I think that's what it is, a pledge. Um, I, my, I'm specifically interested in this impact of the estate tax on family-owned enterprises. 
And recently, Copley Press in San Diego is forced to sell off nine of its small newspapers in order to pay the estate tax liability. Um, that's when their, their principal died. What, what do you think that we should do in reform as it relates to those family-owned enterprises specifically? Well, they probably made a decision on selling that, for example, rather than borrowing. I mean, if you have a business... Uh, take a business worth $100 million, and like I say, the estate tax valuations are not usually their asking prices for the businesses later on, but take a business that earns $100 million, or, or is worth $100 million. It probably is earning $8 million or something like that uh, uh, at a minimum. Uh, if $45 million is due on this, uh, the estate tax, uh, there's special provisions, as you know, for the family-owned businesses that spread it out over 15 years. The interest cost on that tops would be three million a year. So there's still five million a year left over with the business. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's inconvenient, but when somebody wins the lottery, somebody wins a million, it, hundred million it? dollar lottery, you know, and they run the story in the paper, they also mention the fact they'll probably have to pay 40 million of taxes. Now I send that person a congratulatory card, not a sympathy card. I mean, they, they, uh, they have now, and somebody wins the ovarian lottery and inherits a business worth a hundred million and has 40 million that they owe in tax. Uh, they've got a hundred million dollar asset to work with. They may elect to sell off part of it, like uh, somebody may sell off some of the newspapers. They may elect to borrow forty million. But, but don't you think in, that's in any it? event they got the carrying capacity to do that? There, it is true when you get into farms and ranch. I've got a son that farms eight hundred acres in Illinois, and it's worth six thousand an acre now, but it doesn't earn based on six thousand an acre. So if you get an asset, a piece of art that's worth a lot of money but does not produce much income. It's one thing, but with the businesses, I look at businesses all the time, and you are not going to get a business valued at $100 million by the, by the uh, a court uh, with a, an estate tax change, a challenge that's earning less than $8 million. And like I say, that, that will leave $5 million over after you set up the payments to, to, to pay interest to $3 million a year. It was actually less than $3 million in the early years. So you would make no reform as it specifically relates to family-owned businesses oh, yeah. from their structure. And, and that's a structure you think that's manageable when you're dealing. I mean, I'm a great deal of concern about media concentration. We have an FCC that's moving forward on that. It's becoming increasingly hard for family-owned businesses particularly in the newspaper industry, it's a very complex structure to try to run an operation that way, divvying up various assets and resources among family members and still running a business. I don't know. Uh, to me, that's a very complex operation and a very big challenge, all because of the estate tax. Well, they, they would like you to believe that. But if, if, if you have a newspaper that's worth $500 million, you know, it is, it is probably throwing off uh, $50 million a year. That's why it's worth $500 million. And if you pay... If you borrow $200 million or $225 million to pay the estate tax on that and, you're, and your interest rate is 7%, uh, that's $15 million a year, you've got $35 million a year left over. I mean, it, it, you know, it, they'd rather not pay the tax. But I know of no newspaper owner that owned a monopoly newspaper uh, who, after the estate tax, ever ended up leaving anything but a lot of money. And let me ask you specifically, because you when you make your donation at whatever point in time to the Gates Foundation. Well, I, that's do it, I do it every July. They've, they've received two installments each worth about a little less than $2 billion. But when you think about this investment, that uh, the charitable contribution, you're making a decision about what you think is the best use of your funds. Absolutely. But why wouldn't you want... Here we are basically incentivizing or saying from a tax structure perspective, you can make those charitable contributions, but if somebody wants to invest in their business, they they've have a, a tax. They've got a lot of money to invest in their business, but I, we invest at Berkshire Hathaway. We, we'll pay $5 billion of federal income tax in 2007. We still have money to invest in, we have our after-tax money to invest in the business, so we will have, we'd have $5 billion more if we didn't have to pay any federal income tax. But we, we pay tax, we make a lot of money, we pay a lot of tax, we reinvest the balance. And people with their newspapers can do the same thing. They might prefer if they didn't pay any tax, but they have the resources. They have ample resources to pay the tax. They have the earning power to do it, and they will have money left, plenty of money left over, money the average American would only dream of. And you don't think that there's anything structurally about some of those smaller businesses juxtaposed to Berkshire Hathaway that'll, that complicates that structure for them? Well, I think when you get down to the very small ones, uh, sure, and I, I would have an exemption for those. But, but uh, 
a business that makes $8 million a year worth $100 million, uh, you know, I'd love, that's a high-class problem. There's 23 million families in this country that are making 20000 a year or less that would just love to have that problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time's up. Thank you, Senator. Um, I'd like to ask um, to, uh, Sir uh, Sukup and Mr. Rhodes, the degree to which you can live with uh, the amounts suggested by Mr. Buffett. Um, I think it's everyone in this room knows we're not going to repeal the estate tax. It isn't going to happen in, in the foreseeable future. So the next question is, what should the law be? What's reasonable? What makes sense? We want certainty, we want predictability, but what are the exemption levels and what should the rates be, et cetera? I mean, this is, this is not rocket science. <laughs> it's pretty basic. And so the question is, the degree to which you, Mr. Rhodes and Mr. Sukup, can live with the, the broad parameters that was somewhat outlined by Mr. Buffett, don't put words in his mouth, be talked about a $4 million exemption. I assume that's an individual, husband, wife, you know, it's eight. Yeah. Um, and I assume, I don't know whether we're going to have a family uh, uh, owned business exception here or not. If, if so, there'd be some limits there. But what, uh, what can you live with? Something along the lines that Mr. Buffett uh, suggested. Yeah, I, I believe. Indexed, remember indexed. Mm, the ranches in Nevada uh, are larger than any place in the United States. So I think a four to six million dollar exemption would would cover most family f ranchers and farmers in in my state. Mr. Sukup, uh, it's hard for me to say. Uh, with our company, uh, we would like to uh, you know have uh, repeal the death tax, but I can't really say uh, what would help us out. I mean, anything is going to help. There's no question. There's going to be a, it's, we're not, it's not going to be repealed. I think that's a given. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if it's not repealed, you know, what, what's reasonable? What makes sense here? Well, uh, and Mr. Buffett gave it a, you know, starting point. You know, yeah. Well, threw, I'd like threw, to some, see it threw some numbers out for discussion. I'd like to see it at 10 or 15 million, uh, you know, and, and, uh, benefit in there for family owned or businesses that continue on throughout the years. Do I like someone's suggestion here where they mentioned as long as it stayed in the company and it wasn't sold. Uh, when yeah. it was sold, then you could, uh, you know, levy the tax or something. But, it could, but what would happen to your business if, say, we're four individual, you know, husband, wife, eight, um, indexed, and you have the benefit of all the different kinds of estate planning that Mr. Titel and his, you know, his, his, his folks have, would you have to sell your business if say when you unfortunately pass away uh, would we have to sell it now yes. would you have to sell it at those levels the, at, 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 the, at four million indexed um, with all the planning devices that are available today we probably would uh, you have you to sell it have to sell it why is because, that well when you start to getting the tax up that you have to borrow 15 to 20 million and it depends on, uh, you know, and, when and we pass away. I don't mean to get personally, but what's, what's the value of, you think of the state might be? How much? Uh, the value of our estate? Yeah. Probably 70 million. 70. Okay. And you think you'd have to sell? Uh, this would be up to our sons whether they want to accept the debt or not. Yeah. And then right. the thing it's is... It's a tough that, situation. I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic because this, is, this happened in our family. Um, it's a question of what... There, I have a brother and a sister taking over the family ranch, and um, we have the same issues. But the, as you all know, these questions are very complex. There's a lot to do with who really wants to stay in the business. Some children want to do something else. Who wants to take on the debt? How much debt to take on? Can they handle the debt? You know, there are lots of different um, options here. But it's, uh, we, we, we worked it out. Uh, the ranch is not sold off. Well, but I'm so but fortunate. It's, but it's very, very difficult. I'm so fortunate, that. Senator, to have both sons, and the only two sons in the family, mm -hmm. and they're both in the business, and they go their ways in the business to run each correction of it. Right. But, okay. We have to find a solution here, though. It's, it's fair. It's, it can get 60 votes so we can get some predictability and some certainty here. That's, that's the goal. Thank you very much. I've got to leave here, but, uh, Senator... Senator Kyle, you're next. And Senator Lincoln, if you want to chair the rest of the hearing. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Th thanks again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of points and, and questions here. I think the, uh, the estate tax amounts to about 1% of our federal revenues uh, each year. It's loathed by anywhere between 60 and 80% of the people who are surveyed, depending upon the survey, including those people who know they'll never have to either pay it or plan against it. The majority in Congress actually favor repeal 
Last year, I think the vote, uh, and I believe that there were two different votes where 57 members of this body favored repeal or significant reform. And so one of the questions is, um, uh, with that uh, support for repealing it or substantially reforming it, why can't it be done? And one of the answers is, of course, that the insurance industry, which makes a lot of money on it, uh, lobbies very strenuously to retain the estate tax because they can sell people insurance, which is one way to uh, shelter some of the income. Now, uh, and they've been lobbying very, very strongly uh, uh, to maintain a 45% rate. I know that, uh, Mr. Buffett, y you have spoken with passion about uh, what, what you consider to be um, uh, a tax that, that can help end dynasties, and so I know this is a personal view of yours. But it's also true that your company benefits greatly. In fact, you own several insurance companies, doesn't it, Bricker? Yeah, we, we own property casualty insurance companies. Uh, right. and, and life insurance. Uh, we, we own a company that reinsures life. We do not sell life insurance directly to the public. What, what percentage of your profits do you think are made either on the insurance or the float uh, from the insurance on an annual basis, just nominally, roughly speaking? Well, the life insurance company, the property casualty insurance company insures autos, insures homeowners. Uh, has nothing to no, do with just, I, I'm just talking life and, life, and the life float on the life. Is a, the life company is a reinsurance company. Uh, it, it writes health insurance. I would say that uh, it would be, uh, be well, it would be well under a half of 1%. And how about the... It, it, not, I mean, that's I'm all sorry. kinds of life insurance. That's, uh, people buy life insurance for a lot of other things. Sure, state. sure. Um, by the way, one of the more famous companies I think you own is Geico. Is that is that correct? That, that's that's great what, advertising on that. No, that's by where the way. we make some money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do, do they sell any life insurance? No. Okay. Um, but but the point this this industry this life insurance industry uh, can make a lot of money when uh, one of the methods of uh, sheltering income is the inve is the purchasing of life insurance. And I kidded one of my friends who who uh, lobbies for them. If if Congress magically came up with a way to end death. Uh, he'd be in there uh, representing the undertakers, uh, opposing us somehow or other. I mean, it's just not fair, it seems to me, to uh, take advantage of people or, or to rather to urge Congress to keep a law in place uh, so that you can sell them something that, that they wouldn't have to buy otherwise. And the only reason they buy it is to shelter income because they clearly would prefer that it go to a charitable cause uh, rather than to the United States government. And I just wanted to note, because there, there seems to be a big disconnect, I appreciated Senator Cantwell's comments. It's one thing for a company that pays billions in taxes and, and another for a company that may be worth maybe five or ten million dollars uh, to consider their options. A, a real case in my hometown of Phoenix involved a printing company uh, and virtually all of the assets, uh, the earnings went back into the company every year because in that business you either bought the latest printer or, or you didn't do well. They had about, uh, the, the, the person that started it came out from New York uh, as an individual. He ended up with over 200 employees. When the estate tax came due, they could not borrow enough because they, everything was back in the business itself. Um, and the end result was they had to sell uh, this business to pay the taxes. The family wanted to stay in the business. The son-in-law continued to advise the purchasers for a couple of years. Eventually, however, they were bought by a bigger company, and then that company was bought by a bigger company, which then consolidated operations, sold off all of the equipment for whatever it was worth, closed the business, 200 plus employees, out of work. And the other point is that this family was one of the most charitable giving families in Phoenix. Uh, had a great reputation for giving to all sorts of causes. Of course, once the company was bought, not another dime in contributions from that company. So much like in your community, Mr. Support, where you do contribute 10 percent, and it's a big part of the community. That was the case here. So it was more, I mean, it was a kind of a heart and soul. The community lost out. The employees all lost out. The family that had great capability to run this business isn't running it anymore. In fact, the business got shut down. Those are the kind of stories that we would like to end uh, with reform of the estate tax, and I agree with others who have spoken here. The votes aren't there to repeal it, uh, notwithstanding its unfairness, but I think we can make it much more fair and uh, provide that at least for those estates uh, that are, are in the lower, you know, maybe five to ten million, something in that neighborhood, 
we should have to uh, create an, uh, a situation where they don't have to worry about spending as much on the estate preparation as they might actually have to pay in the taxes. I, I just know, and, uh, by the way, a question for any of you. My, the, the estimate has been that there is as much spent each year on estate planning, uh, folks like uh, Mr. Uh, Titel and on insurance and, and lawyers and so on, as the estate tax actually collects uh, roughly $20 billion a year. Any, any contradiction of that to your knowledge? Well, I can just tell you how some clients feel. One client said estate planning under the current law is the orderly and systematic transfer of a client's wealth and assets into fees and commissions. Beats okay. paying it into taxes, I guess. <laughs> Thank you all. And, and again, I, I really do. I, I've lived with it for 50-some years of having an estate that would be taxable. I would say that uh, uh, I would say the applicable portion of the total attorney's fees I've had hasn't, hasn't been more than $25,000, and I've never bought any life insurance to take care of it. You're getting a heck of a deal if you only pay $25,000, because I think some of these folks with a lot smaller estates pay a lot more than that. I thank uh, our friend from Arizona, and I, th I think I want to pick up with you, Mr. Rhodes, and you, Mr. Suckup, on this question of the calamity that this committee is going to be facing here fairly shortly. I mean, there is really going to be chaos in the tax world, and a whole host of matters, income tax rates, capital gains, uh, estate taxes. I think you all have a very compelling, you know, case, and I'm certainly trying to fit this into my thinking on how to respond here for, for 2010. The point that Senator Kyle has made I think is very valid. What I, I see at home in Oregon is a lot of our farmers and ranchers and small business people pour enormous sums into all of these exercises to try to figure out how to keep, keep the ax from, from falling. And they're not, they're not plutocrats. They're not well-to-do people. They're just people trying to run family businesses. So for you two who are running businesses and ranchers, if you were on the Senate Finance Committee and you were facing this tax meltdown and you had to figure out how to get people some relief on the estate tax issue and deal with the capital gains question so as to promote growth and fairness and the income tax issue, how would you all, just from the seat of your pants, if, you, if the roles were reversed, you were on this side of the, the dais, how would you all approach it, Mr. Sucka? Oh, this is a very difficult uh, situation for you, Senator, and I uh, appreciate you know, all the work you're doing to try to solve this problem. And to satisfy to everybody is going to be impossible. There is no question about it. Some of us are going to be unhappy about it, I'm sure. But uh, we do need the rate much higher than it is for our particular company and on the estate tax on side. the estate tax. the exempt amount the exemption and that the uh, 45 percent rate we would like to see that go down if that could go down to 15 or 20 percent uh, it would make it much more palatable and from the standpoint of your business that's more important to you than potential changes on the income tax side and capital gains and like because that's what it's really going to come down to and Frankly, that's why I'm so interested in going back to the philosophy of Ronald Reagan and Bill Bradley is that I think they looked at the whole picture, figured out how to give everybody a chance to get ahead, farmers and ranchers, and people who work, work for a living. And that's why I'm trying to bring that philosophy back in the context of what the Congress uh, is going to be looking at. But, but I gather that of the big three, in terms of estate taxes, capital gains, and income taxes, estate taxes is the one that you'd put as the big one. That's the one we are facing and would be the greatest. I think the uh, committee is going to have to look at how much the increase is in the farmland and farmers and that. Like Mr. Buffett said, their land in Illinois, which used to sell for 3000 is up to 6000 an acre now. This is going to raise tremendously. And if you want to stay at the same amount of your $24 uh, billion, to, uh, it, it's going to change your levels that you look at in there because the whole economy uh, of, out there is raising and going up to, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent out there. 
We've got uh, small business people all over Oregon who are in much the same situation you all are in, in Sheffield, and we're going to try to figure out how to, how to be responsive. Mr. Rhodes, same question. You've got all these tax changes you know, coming, income taxes, capital gains, estate taxes, it all comes up in the context of decisions that have to be made in this room and decisions that you've got to deal with in a thoughtful way or there's going to be a lot of hurt in our country. How would you approach it? I'm uh, on the Senate Finance Committee in the state of Nevada, and I know all the problems about taxes and all that. There you are. But, um, I think I would agree with, the, with the, the gentleman who spoke before me. I think the estate tax is the number one tax that is hurting us in the livestock industry and in farms and small businesses in the state of Nevada. As you know, we have no uh, inheritance tax and in Nevada state inheritance tax, so I think most of us could live with a 4 to $6 million exemption. What, what's your sense? I, I think uh, Mr. Suckup got pounded on this one earlier. What's your sense on what a typical small business will have to spend on insurance and all of the efforts to try to keep from getting clobbered by state taxes? Yeah, I, I'm afraid I can't answer that. Um, perhaps you could... Uh... Um, well, top well, of my head. well, we'll leave the record open so that if there's any information you can you can give us because I think, frankly, in our efforts to reform the estate tax, and I've been like a lot of senators here. I voted for repeal in the past. I voted for changes. I, I've now come to the conclusion that I think this has got to come in the broader context of tax reform, and it's it's why I I think that the model of keeping some progressivity, cleaning out the clutter, holding down rates for everybody, at least gives some certainty and predictability, which I've heard farmers and business people talking about. But if we're going to do this you know, right, and Senator Lincoln's put a lot of time into this as well, we've got to get a sense of how much small business people are paying today for these insurance and planning kinds of kinds of tools. Do you want to add anything, Mr. Sucka? Yes, I would just like to say that it's the individual that's in the company, and probably our company did not spend enough on uh, life insurance and other things to avoid the uh, uh, estate tax, which I wanted to apply it back to the company. I had wonderful employees, and uh, they were doing a great job, so we bought the le very latest equipment for them instead of putting it in life insurance. Now we're going to pay the price. Mr. Buffett, only one, one comment, and I've enjoyed talking with you about tax reform o o over the years. Uh, uh, a tall Democrat 20 years ago on the Finance Committee wanted to be part of a bipartisan effort to fix the tax code, and I went to school on a basketball scholarship. My jump shot was certainly not as good as Bill, Bill Bradley's, but I hope that you and other business people will keep saying that's the model that we ought to pick up on. We can have debates about the specifics about how to do it. But we have had 20 witnesses before the Finance and Budget Committee, and I've asked each of them, of all different philosophies, whether they think the basic structure that Ronald Reagan and Bill Bradley talked about 20 years ago was right. And 19 out of those 20 witnesses said that they did. I appreciated your uh, supportive comments this morning. And if you can be part of an effort with business people around, around the country to keep drilling that message home. I hope we can have another bipartisan uh, tax reform effort, much like Ronald Reagan and Bill Bradley did in this, in this room coming up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I think I'm the, the bringing up the rear here. I've just got a, a few more questions, if I may. Um, I'd like to follow up a little bit from Senator Cantwell um, in her discussion about the family-owned newspaper businesses, Mr. Buffett. I know on your company's website um, you have a link to an owner's manual for your investors, and on that page I think um, there's a document where you make a statement and you say, on my death, Berkshire's ownership picture will change, but not in a disruptive way. None of my stock will have to be sold to take care of the cash bequeaths that I have made uh, or for taxes. And I think looking at the other end of the table, um, Mr. Sukup would love to be able to say that um, in his business. And whereas your businesses are really parts of your business, um, for other small business owners, it, particularly Mr. Rhodes, and, and I would think Mr. Sukup too, it's their heritage. 
Um, so there, it is a little bit of apples and oranges in terms of, of, of how those things are dealt with and in terms of, of the generations, um, you know, that would depend on them in that perspective of, of being able to um, take that family heritage and, and continue to provide for the next generation and the generation after that. So um, I think that's an important thing that we have to understand as well if we want to maintain the, the entrepreneurial engine of the small businesses and the family-owned businesses in this country, and I think that we do. Um, it is also an issue we have to deal with in terms of, of um, particularly family-owned farms and ranches. Uh, we're debating the farm bill right now, and the fact is, is whether it's land prices or whether it's trade issues or whether it's um, uh, tariffs and, and um, are denied access to markets in other countries and a whole host of things, we're seeing a decline um, and, and probably in the next couple of years, for the first time in the history of our country, we'll see a trade deficit in agriculture. Um, and that's going to make it more and more difficult to keep those family farmers. But then on the other side, we have all these huge arguments about corporate farms, um, uh, who nobody really can define those. Most of them are family farms that are incorporated between fathers and sons and daughters and, and what have you. So um, I do think that that's an issue that we kind of have to uh, take a little time and, and, um, and really think, uh, think through. One of the things, um, that two questions that I have left on my mind. One is, um, I, had, we, I think we had expected um, that, or had hoped that we'd have a representative from the insurance industry here today. Um, they've been vocal in their opposition or concern about what it does to their industry. And from your website, again, I noticed that there's a tremendous amount, or at least 49% of your um, businesses there that are in insurance, um, Mr. Buffett. And practically, I don't, practically none from life insurance, though, Madam Chair. Is that right? No, practically none. No life insurance there? Uh, just it, There's a, some life reinsurance, but it's practically none. Mm -hmm. It's not as good a business as property casualty. That's one of the reasons. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, you are a good businessman. We know that. Um, but following up on Mr. Suka, because I know that in our own family business and farm, um, my dad was um, very cautious and wanted to make sure that there was life insurance. Um, but he also wanted to reinvest in the farm, and he wanted to buy um, more property and, and the ability for my mother to have that as a retirement uh, to fall back on. Um, but I guess to, to all of you all, we hear a lot about how, you know, when we talk about family farms and other things, um, that the, um, the farms not necessarily being sold in order to pay estate tax. Well, a lot of those family farms are and businesses are paying insurance, and they're, they're paying into those insurance. And, and it, it's, it's taking away their ability to reinvest. Mr. Suka have, has made a different decision um, in his sense. He's, he's tried to, to split the difference there, and I don't blame him um, because he wanted to build that business and be an active part of what he was able to give to his children. But it does strike me as a little bit unfair um, and costly to the cash flow and their competitive in terms of the marketplace for family-owned businesses. Um, they've got to pay an insurance company uh, for years kind of in those premiums to protect the integrity of, of their farms or their businesses. My question to you would be, what would be, if, if the value of that money that pay, is paid in and in, into that insurance company um, that invest, and it may not be life insurance, but you've got a lot of annuities, don't you? Don't you? No, we, 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 we're not big in the annuity business at no? all. No? Okay. Um, anyway, what if we were able to give the opportunity to the small business or to the family-owned business uh, or farm the ability to um, prepay that estate tax um, in a way that you were actually kind of self-insuring and then you still had those resources um, as an uh, as a um, as an annuity or as a a, um, a capital investment or a, a, as as a resource that you could use as your backing uh, in terms of reinvesting in yourself, as opposed to giving those dollars to the insurance industry, um, where they're going to take it and invest it and make the money off of it. Um, the ability to give small businesses and others to site like prepay their their some of their estate tax and then use that as a collateral um, in in the needs that they have to grow. Well, Madam Chair, I, I have no objection to any 
I, I, I think you wouldn't get too many takers on a prepay plan, but I, I would have no objection to that. I really think, uh, I should mention, incidentally, that Ted Turner is the largest landowner in Nebraska, and, and uh, uh, by some margin, and uh, uh, my guess is he'll be able to pay his estate taxes in fine shape. But <laughs> I, I, I empathize, my, my, like I say, my, farm, my son would never give up farming. I mean, he loves it, and, and he'll never sell an acre <laughs> unless he has to. Uh, but but that's I, the point. I, he doesn't have to. Well, mine did. <laughs> well, my brother no, he did. doesn't have. He doesn't have a lot of money. I mean, that's. Uh, uh, he ran for office one time. I told him he should put his name in small letters on the ballot because he's <laughs> Buffett with no capital. Uh, <laughs> essentially, the. Uh, but I, but I do think what I uh, just pulled out of the air a little while ago actually uh, addresses this problem. If if I would have no problem with somebody with a family-owned business or a a farm, which is a family-owned business of a specialized sort, sure. uh, if on their death the tax is computed, uh, interest is accumulated on it if it's not paid, but it doesn't become due until the farm or the business leaves the family. And the, the, in effect, the government would collect its money plus interest. Nobody would have to sell a thing. Nobody would have to give up any dollars of working at improvement. Nobody would have to move their plants. They could do it for generation after generation, and in the end, the, the government would get what it would have gotten originally, plus interest on it. And, and nobody has suffered in between as long as it's in the family. I, and if that family, that farm's worth $200 million someday, and they sell it, and the accumulated obligation now is $60 million, then the heirs get $140 million, and they decided to sell a family farm. But I think the biggest problem, and you all correct me if I'm wrong, that we've run into in that is in terms of the cost. Because when we go to do something like that, to, to make a carve out like that, um, it gets scored at an enormous cost. Well, um, it, and so it, yeah, in, in, 19, in 2006, taxable estates were $116 billion. In that $116 billion, there were $770 million of farm assets, six tenths of 1% of all the assets. If I die tonight, I have a farm. I'm not a farmer, so some of the even some of the six tenths of one percent. So it is not a it would not be a huge item, and the government would have an asset. It would have this claim, which it was eventually going to collect with interest. So I, I, I would. Well, we think can that look at. I mean, I've certainly been supportive of the carve outs for for family farms and and some of what we've talked about. The concern that that we always get presented when we start talking about that um, from the estimates that we get is the enormous cost that it that we see um, and what it what it does to the cost of what we're trying to do, because we're trying to be fiscally responsible in how we move forward in, in uh, estate tax reform, reform and what it costs us. So um, um, I don't have any further questions. I appreciate so much um, um, all of you all bringing to the table your particular expertise. And I hope that you won't go far, because I think you have found that there are many of us here on the committee that feel a tremendous passion about doing something and moving forward and making things right. Um, and we're certainly going to need your continued interest and continued input into this issue. Thank you so much. The committee stands adjourned.